Hi, uh, my name is Audrey Newman. Um, I'm standing in for uh, for uh, Joe Evinger, who is our uh, coordinator and also our usual host. Um, Hillary Naylor is our co-host and technical expert, and she has um, explained our Zoom procedures. And she will also be in charge of starting the recording in a few minutes if we haven't started it already. Um, the Science and Ideas group has more than 60 members with varied backgrounds and uh, who share a common interest in science and new ideas. Um, we meet here on Zoom on the second Thursday of every month from three to approximately 4.30. Um, Let's see, we have a guest speaker each time who speaks to us on a topic related to science and ideas. And um, each talk is open to members and all other interested people. A discussion of the ideas presented follows each link. And we hope that every single one of you will have a question or a comment after this presentation. Um, we rely, this is a very important statement we rely on our science and ideas group members, all Ashby Village members, all invitees, that's you, and all presenters for ideas on other new speakers and ways to connect to them. Um, if you have ideas for topics and presenters, please contact Joe Edminger. Um Our speaker today, I guess we should start recording now if we haven't already. Uh, yeah, we're recording. Okay, good, thanks. Um, our speaker today, Roger Newman, is known to many of you as a longtime participant and contributor to the group. He's an Ashby Village member and volunteer and a former community college instructor of anthropology, history, and environmental science. Among his previous talks are three which were focused on early human migrations out of Africa and what the new information from fossil DNA has been able to add to this story. Um, he has also spoken on uh, evolution of beauty, what's in a name, and dinosaur birds. Today, Roger is going to talk to us about language and history. This talk will expand on themes discussed in Out of Africa 3, Early Human Migrations into Europe, which Roger presented as part of the Science and Ideas series last year. Additionally, he will talk about the history of the English language and the various influences that have contributed to our modern use of English. Roger, thank you for giving this talk about language and history, which I know has been a passion of yours for many years. Please, please tell us about how you became interested in the study of language and where it has led. Okay, um, thank you for that introduction, Audrey. Um, yeah, so I've been interested in language a long time, and I, I, as are many people, I think that language is fascinating to us. Um, I was fortunate as a teenager, well, not even a preteen. Um, I was about 12 years old. And uh, my my uh, father got a, a teaching gig in uh, Chile in South America. And my mother, my sister and I went down to uh, spend some time with him and come back together. And so we uh, flew down in those days, it was a, a DC six, so a little puddle hopper, you know, we made our way down to South America. And uh, one of the stops was Rio de Janeiro. And it was absolutely uh, fabulous to me. Uh, it, it just, I just, because I'd never been out of the country, I'd never, you know, here we were in this amazing, colorful, interesting uh, place with people jabbering and something that I didn't know what it was. But I just remember uh, being just blown away by it and um, wanted to do more of, you know, traveling and and of course, you have to learn how to talk to people so that. And then I got to be pretty good at studying languages. I did French and Spanish and Latin when I was in high school. 
And uh, the big revelation there was that I was actually better than my older brother at something. Up until then, I, I didn't think that was possible. I mean, it wasn't even in the realm of thought. <laughs> and all of a sudden, it's like, oh, he isn't better at me than everything. So anyway, so I went up to college and I um, studied anthropology and I was just um, very, uh, you know, in love with the field because um, who wouldn't like a job um, going to exotic places around the world, learning about um, wonderful people and their customs and then coming home and telling people about it. Uh, that, that was to me uh, an amazing idea that I could do that. And I actually have been able to make a profession out of it, which is very, very fortunate. And I'm very uh, grateful for that. So uh, with that, I'm gonna uh, share my screen and uh, get into this presentation. And so uh, let's see. It's not on the right slide, but we'll get there. Oh, here we are. Yeah. Okay. All right. So this is the title slide, Language and History. Um, obviously a big topic, and I'm, <laughs> there's so many things that I, I could talk about, but here's what I want to do. Uh, the Tower of Babel, this wonderful story from the Bible about this uh, King Nimrod, who um, thought, let's build a bigger and bigger and we're, you know, he got out uh, uh, too big for his britches. And uh, God uh, smote his tower and all the people had to run away. And then they uh, couldn't, they, they found that they couldn't talk to each other. And so that's Roger, the... just just one minute. Can you put the Tower of Babel on the screen? Uh, right, okay. right now we're looking at is it the um is that better? First slide. Ah, there we go. Yeah, thank you. Oh, okay, great. Thank you for that. So anyway, this is a Peter Bruegel's uh, rendition of what the Tower of Babel looked like. Of course, nobody knows, and it's a lost in the myths of uh, in the mists of myth. So um, but anyway, uh, here's what I want to get into in this talk. I'm going to start with a few general points about language, um, then how language families are discovered. And this is a very, very interesting field with the, that we compare different languages and see which ones fall together into families. Um, how languages change, uh, the discovery of the Indo-European language family, which is uh, the family of languages, of course, that we belong to, uh, and how it was discovered and how people learned about it. Um, and then about the Indo-European people, um, origin and spread of the Indo-European people. So that's a, a topic of uh, great interest to me. I've done a lot of stuff, as you know, about migrations. So really what we're looking at here today is how does the study of language contribute to our understanding? Um, then a brief survey of language, how the English language developed. And at the end, I'd like to do a little discussion because um, uh, everybody is just so upset about pronouns nowadays. You know, here's this uh, thing about language that um, we're all faced with this dilemma, you know, uh, he, she, they, and so on. Well, we'll talk about pronouns at, uh, later at the, at the end. Um, this is just a slide from the previous talk, which um, uh, Audrey mentioned, Out of Africa 3. So that's where we met the Indo-Europeans, but was focused on archaeological and genetic information. And now we're going to get back to the language uh, or part of it. Um, so here's John McWhorter, who's sort of my hero as far as uh, studying languages. Um, he's a professor at uh, Columbia University. Unfortunately, he wasn't there when I was there. I studied, I got my master's and my bachelor's at Columbia. Of course, he's a lot younger. That might explain it. Um, but one, one of the things I like about him is that, that although he does write books, uh, he also gives lecture series. And since language is the spoken medium, I think that it's very appropriate that he he would do it by talking. And so these are some of the, the great courses here, the story of human language. Like there's just a, a, several of them actually. And if you're interested in, in 
the topic, you can get get him on the great courses uh, or the app Wondrium. Wondrium is a wonderful app for all kinds of uh, information. So the fields of anthropology, um, uh, cultural variation, that's uh, uh, cultural anthropology. That's what I started out in. Um, linguistic anthropology, how languages work, uh, syntax, phonology. We're not going to go into all the ins and outs of it, but a little bit. Um, how they're related, how they change, uh, how they function in societies. Of course, it's more sociolinguistics. Um, archaeology and prehistory um, and human evolution, including uh, the genetics. So th this is the wonderful thing about anthropology is that it's very broad. And so um, you get information. And I think this is one of the nice things about this particular topic is that is that it, it does draw on information from from all of the various fields. So it, it's a perfect example of uh, why it's important to have a broad background. Um, so linguistic anthropology in particular, uh, we're gonna study uh, spoken language. Um, it's very difficult for people who are um, used to writing. And here we are looking at writing, but we're also speaking, but in somehow in our culture, I think that the writing um, gets uh, preference or seems more permanent or more significant. But when you think about the background of people, um, people have been around for two to 300,000 years in terms of Homo sapiens, our particular species. And we think that they were speaking a long time before they were writing. You know, writing is a relatively recent phenomenon in only about 5,000 years. So um, anyway, we're, we're talking about the spoken language. And then um, it describes the components of the language um, in their everyday lives. I mentioned that. Um, and uh, cognates. So a cognate, uh, that's where two, a language, oh, excuse me, a word in two different languages looks similar. And we'll show some examples. And cognate means born together. So they come from a common source. And that, that's what we're looking for to see uh, relationships. Um, paleo languages. Now we're going to talk about uh, Paleo Indo-European and some of the others um, a bit. And of course, these are reconstructed. It's not like we could go out there and speak it, although I do have an example of uh, speaking Proto-Indo-European, which is kind of fun. Um, so uh, language is fundamental. Uh, normal humans have the genes for language, but not for a specific language. So any baby can learn any language. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with adoptions and, you know, immigrants who come and the parents don't speak English, but the children automatically become Americans. So, so you know, I mean, it's just a process, but uh, that was not, um, that's that's been discovered. Let's put it that way. Um, there are no fossils for language, so we don't know when it began. Um, it's hard to say, but there's a lot of sort of speculation about that, but let's just say it was a long time ago. <laughs> uh, language is a spoken medium. And of course, writing, now I have a certain amount of prejudice about writing, is that it, it preserves older pronunciations. So the, the, though, you know, what's a GH doing in though? And why is enough got a F at the end of it? You know, it has to do with how this how it was pronounced at the time that it started to be written. And um, it, uh, it, it, I, I, I always marvel at these um, spelling bees, you know, and it seems like the uh, children of, immigrants from India have some special ability to memorize spelling, which I, I take my hat off to, but I think, well, why couldn't you learn something more valuable than, than the spelling? The spelling is sort of odd. Um, so, uh, yeah, we did this one. Oh, I don't know how that got in there. Uh, okay, some more uh, basic facts. Um, 
each generation modifies the language it inherits. This is a really, really important point. I'm sure if you try to talk to your grandkids, you're well aware that the language has changed and changes a lot. And not just because there's new technological words or whatever, but they use it differently. And they'll turn nouns into verbs and all kinds of stuff. And the older people sometimes get mad at them because they're not doing it right. Well, uh, every generation modifies it and remakes the language in their own image. And so get used to it. Um, but some, uh, some languages seem to be more conservative. I find this really interesting. So like Icelandic, among the Nordic uh, languages, it's, it's closely related to Norwegian and a little more distantly to Swedish, but it does seem to preserve some old forms. And we've seen that in, uh, in our country, uh, in Appalachia, for example, there are people who uh, have preserved some of the older forms while the rest of the culture was changing and developing. And among the Indo-European languages, Lithuanian is considered to be the least changed. So uh, that's pretty interesting. If you want to get close to that, you could learn Lithuanian. Um, some parts change more than others. So certainly words uh, and content words. We're going to distinguish between content words and function words. So content words, nouns, verbs, adjectives, they actually have some meat to them, some meaning. And, and the function words uh, are kind of helper, helper words, you could say. And then, of course, there's the grammatical structure, syntax, and other things. And um, this doesn't change as much. Um, it's more basic. But it does change. And there's some very interesting examples we'll get into with, uh, with English, where it picked up uh, some structural items from the Celtic background, which I find really fascinating. And then there's sounds, the phonemes, the sounds and the meaning. There's all these different parts of language. I'm not going to cover everything. But so languages can divide and diverge into language families. So Latin becomes Italian, French, Spanish, Portuguese. So we're familiar with that. And that really is, I think, key to this whole thing is that is that early, they called them philologists at the time, um, knew that about Latin and they could see that, that Latin had changed in different places in different ways. So it's an example of that uh, where they, people seized upon um, now here, uh, not possible to regulate language usage. You may be familiar with the Académie Française. Uh, they've tried to, to keep English words out of French, uh, because they think it's contaminating and they, they should have their own. So they, uh, an example of that is the word drugstore. And, uh, so they said, well, we have the word pharmacy. Why wouldn't that be good enough? And the answer is that a drugstore, as you're well aware, uh, yes, it might have some medicine in there, but it's got a whole lot of other stuff too. So the drugstore, as the French would pronounce it, um, uh, is still in the language. Um, so let's see. Let's see. Okay, so... Um, how many languages are there? Now, this is really a matter of definition. Uh, because um, if a language is has to be an official language of a country or something, or it has to be written down, or it has to this, it has to that, you're going to miss out on 90% of them. So the fact is that um, uh, languages um, are really anything that people are speaking in, in a community, in a speech community. And a lot of people will say, oh, well, it's just a dialect, you know, as if that's, you know, less significant. Well, it might be less significant to you, but it's highly significant to the people who are speaking it. So linguists um, say, look, they're speaking it, it's a language. Uh, so, um, we always run into that problem when people say, well, how many languages are there? Uh, like I say, it's, it's, um, 
a matter of the definition. So um, this is this is um, Ethnologue, and it's a very interesting website if you want to check it out. Uh, they it, it's put out by the uh, the Wycliffe. Uh, well, the Wycliffe Bible translators. Now, this is a story about missionaries. Um, you know, there aren't that many linguists, you know, to go uh, collecting all the languages of the world. So the missionaries have picked up the torch. And so uh, this organization, uh, sometimes called Summer Institute of Linguistics, and sometimes it's called the Wycliffe Bible Translators, they have amassed a compendium of all the languages of the world. And they, they reckon, and this is an old figure, 7,139, they, they, they think that we lose approximately two languages every month of the total. And so uh, languages are an endangered species, I guess you could say. Um, so let's take a look at the uh, major languages of the world. Uh, so these color coded, of course, and um, we could spend a lot of time on this and I'll just put it up there at the moment, just we'll get beyond this. But um, what the reason that there is this um, spread of, you know, here's Indo-European, the red one, you know, here's Bantu over here, uh, here's Arabic uh, over here. You know, the reason that you have these uh, vast areas of, of, of a single color, of course, is that something spread and dominated. And it has to do with colonialism and uh, proselytizing and stuff like that. So um, one of my favorite uh, word uh, books is this book by Nicholas Oster, Osler, The Empires of the Word. So it's a language history of the word, and it it gets into all around the world all these stories about how people came to speak the languages that they speak. And a lot of times it has to do where they were invaded or they were taken over or they were colonized. And so um, speaking the same language is, is a way of um, building a community. So um, and then a larger community is stronger than a smaller one, so people join up. So anyway, he's uh, he's the chair of the Foundation for Endangered Languages in the UK, and uh, a tough assignment because you know the, there are success stories, but there's also uh, a lot of loss here. And here's a, just a, an image of the uh, Christian explorers at, at contacting some native people. That story went on uh, all around the world. Um, here's the, the voyages of discovery of the uh, Europeans. This is back in the 16th century. So they were going all over and it, that's had a huge effect. So um, let's take a little closer look here at the uh, some of these big language families. Um, the one in blue is Indo-European. Um, let's see if I can get this better. Yeah, okay. So here's Indo-European, um, stretches all the way across. Of course, this would be the Russian uh, language, which is part, is a Slavic language, part of uh, Indo-European, and they go all the way to the coast, of course. Um, and then in Western Europe, um, pretty much all Indo-European with a few isolates like uh, Basque over here, between uh, France and Spain. And then the Uralic languages, the Uralic um, from the Ural Mountains area. Um, these are uh, your Finnish, Estonian, and hung Hungarian. Hungarian is sort of an outlier there. Um, and there's stories about how they got there, uh, how they did that, but it was before anybody was writing it down. And then um, if you notice, here's a, a big splotch of blue down here which is the uh, southern southeastern branch of Indo-European. And Indo-European used to spread across here, but we can tell by the, by the distribution of these language families that the Turks have in some way intruded and broken that chain of Indo-European languages. And um, I'm sure you're familiar with the uh, stories of the 
Mongol Empire and the Turkic empires where they spread around and uh, conquered and all that, uh, coming off the steppes of, uh, of Central Asia. So it, it's reflected in the, in the languages. Um, and then the other one I want to mention, of course, is Afro-Asiatic. And the reason this is so widespread, of course, is because of Arabic. And uh, we'll talk a little bit later about how that happened uh, with the decline of the Roman Empire. Uh, it left uh, a power vacuum in the, and the um, Arabs were able to rush into that. So anyway, there's just tons of interesting stuff that you can uh, that you can see from looking at an illustration like that. Um, so let's see. Uh, now, lingua francas that that means that you can use this language uh, a lot of places, and we are, of course are the beneficiaries of this because English is spoken so far and wide, and these are only the countries where it's a one of the official languages. Uh, there's lots of other places as well. Now, Russian, of course, is, is also very uh, widespread, uh, particularly Central Asia and throughout Siberia, um, Arabic and so on. Um, um, most spoken languages, uh, English and Mandarin are kind of neck and neck. Um, Mandarin, you say, well, aren't they all just Chinese? Well, no, there, <laughs> there are many languages uh, spoken in China, but Mandarin is everybody's second language and increasingly the first language. It's, uh, it's been spread uh, quite effectively. Um, in India, Hindi is widely spoken, Spanish, French, and so on like that. You, you can uh, have a look at all of those. So how do we find cognates and figure out what are language families? Well, you start off with um, what they call articulatory phonetics. What that means is how the sound is made. And so they identify these different parts of the mouth and it's rather technical, but it isn't hard to figure out that, you know, you have some sounds that are made at the front of the mouth and some are made at the back, like a buh or a puh is gonna be made up here and a tuh or it does made back here and a hook uh, back here. So we just do it automatically. We don't think, okay, now I'm gonna use this back part of my mouth, but that's, uh, that's what's happening there. And then the vowels, um, uh, what do I wanna say about vowels? One is that there's a lot of vowels on this chart and there could be more uh, diphthongs and stuff. But um, in our language, in English, the most used vowel is this one right in the middle, which is called schwa. It's the name of that vowel is schwa. And what it is, is it's, it's the uh sound. So in practi practically any word that in a, of more than one syllable that you might say, uh, like if you were to say genetics, Genetics, the e eh in the middle is, the, is a strong vowel, genetics. But the other two, the the, the j and the ticks, is, it doesn't, it's not, it's just a schwa. So it's genetics, maybe ick, a little more, more at the end there. So anyway, that's the kind of thing that they look at, um, try to figure out how the pronunciation works. And so that they're comparing um, languages based on, uh, uh, an adequate, a, 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 a good representation. In other words, we know that the spelling that we have is really pathetic as far as representing the actual sounds. But if you use a phonetic alphabet, uh, and this is sort of a basic one, there, if you study any particular language, you'll find that they they uh, add a, a lot of symbols because different sounds might be used, clicks and stuff like that. But here, here you've got clicks and injectives and implosives and all, all kinds of fun stuff. Um, but with any language, um, chooses the, the, the sounds that they want to emphasize. And so this is what we call the phoneme. So English has 44 phonemes. Um, and this shows you the, uh, the the vowels and the consonants. You can see there's a lot of vowels in English. Um, 
In Spanish, there's five vowels, a, a, e, o, u. So English is much richer in that regard. Um, so then once we ca can figure out, okay, how are we gonna represent the, the words? Then we go and compare them. Now, I didn't do this in uh, phonetics, just this is sort of a modified phonetics. So if you see a, an, what we call an A, it's pronounced A, ah, just like in Spanish or Italian. And the, the O is pronounced O, and the E is pronounced E. So Italian for balcony is balcone, balcone. And it's similar to the Spanish balcon, and the French balcon. The French nasalize the O and kind of leave the But we Portuguese has something else. But um, you can look at these in Iglesia in French is Chiesa in Italian, Igreja in Portuguese, Iglesia in Spanish, and Biserica in Romanian. I don't know any Romanian, but I wish I did. But anyway, this is how you kind of compare and you say, well, these, are, uh, these languages are obviously very closely related because they share a lot of words. They, they, um, the words that they have are kind of... Um, modified according to patterns. Uh, here's another one, um, romance, romance derivative. So Latin is amicus, Italian amico, Sp Spanish amigo, ami. And we use the word friend because we got that from German. Um, but anyway, there's all kinds of uh, comparisons. Now, if you take a look at um, the romance, the uh, the where romance languages are spoken. Um, what I like about this map, this is from the Middle Ages, and um, you know Italy, for example, was uh, united as a single country only in the middle of the nineteenth century. It was about one hundred and fifty years ago, one hundred and seventy years ago. Um, so before that, in the Middle Ages, it was a lot of different countries, if you want to say that, or they they were. Sometimes one of them would gain ascendancy over the other, and sometimes the Spanish had parts of it. So, but my point is that there are different languages spoken there. So here's, you know, Neapolitan is spoken, uh, Emiliano Romagno, I don't know how to pronounce that one, Lombard, uh, Venetian. So these are different languages. Um, and how do you privilege one language over the others? When you unite, uh, it's going to be united under, you know, somebody who's speaking some language. And everybody said, okay, now we're Italian, so we all got to speak Italian. But these regional languages still are spoken in many places. And there are people who think that they should be preserved. Um, and sometimes they have, uh, you know, newspapers and magazines and whatnot, and probably now more uh, oral stuff on the web. But you can say the same thing about France. You can say the same thing about uh, Spain and uh, Portugal. And we still have some of these languages like Catalan and Spain is still there. Uh, Galician, um, that's a, a, a Romance language, but it's now part of Spain. So um, anyway, we, I guess my point is we, we're losing something when we lose the diversity. The diversity, in my view, is a valuable thing all uh, of its own. Um, so some ways that languages change. Old words could take on new meanings. We were literally blown away. Now that's kind of um, not true. I mean, if you were, how, how was the, how was the concert? Oh man, we were literally blown away. You don't mean literally, you mean figuratively. So the word, <laughs> I mean, you weren't blown away. It wasn't like somebody was shooting you with a cannon or something, you know? So it's obviously an exaggeration, but it's using the old words in a new way. And over here, these are just totally new words or new, use, new uses of, of old words. Use the mouse to click on an icon. Now, how many of us could have said that sentence uh, uh, 50 years ago or 30 years ago? Nobody knew that sentence. You know, that's a new sentence. So it, uh, it, it it's, it's clear to us because we see so much change. 
Uh, words entering from other languages. Here's uh, some foreign words, ad nauseum, faux pas, alfresco, angst, minch. These are all imported. Um, and neologisms, these are new, newly coined words. Uh, couch potato. I'm not sure how far back a couch potato goes, but it probably goes back to the origins of television. Uh, clickbait, meme, flabbergasted, tweet. These are all interesting words that you, you could study and you could learn something about the history. Uh, principle of least effort. Uh, people are lazy. So going to becomes gonna. Want to becomes wanna. Woulda, coulda, shoulda. So these are uh, ways that uh, the language kind of shrinks. People leave off the endings and stuff. Uh, combining two existing words or parts of words. This one, I think, is um, extremely important. You know, you, if you look at the new words that are being made, uh, they often have a combination of old elements. So a hatchback, you know, we recognize the word hatch and the word back, but it doesn't really, I mean, it's just the word we decided to use for it. Uh, blackboard, uh, this was a Thing that I used as a teacher for many years, even when it turned white, you know. So now we have a whiteboard and you write on with a marker, but um, we still call it a blackboard, at least I do. Uh, smog is a combination, put two, two things together, as is motel, motor, hotel. Um, Reduplication, of course, that word reduplication is sort of funny because why do you need to have Duplication would have done the job. Uh, Flip-flops, no-no, yada-yada, bling-bling. Um, it's not used as much in English as it's used in certainly Bantu languages and some others, um, but it's there. Uh, acronyms, sometimes we don't know what it stands for, you know, like, like NASA, for example. Everybody knows what NASA is. But if you were to say, well, what does it actually stand for? You'd have to scratch your head and maybe maybe you could figure it out and maybe not. Uh, same thing with laser. You know, it's an acronym. Uh, clipping. Uh, hairdo becomes do. Uh, verbs become nouns. Uh, she had a good cry. So cry is actually a verb. So what's it doing as a noun? Well, in English, we're very flexible. If you don't know something, just Google it. Now, what the heck is a Google? Uh, <laughs> that's a word that I think has been in the language for what, 20 years maybe? Uh, so it changes and I, I don't have to convince anybody of that. Now, um, the Swadesh list, um, the, 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 there was a um, linguist named Morris Swadesh and he wanted to study how languages change. And what he came up with, he said, you know, the, there's certain basic vocabulary, the, the stuff that's very, very used all the time. And so it won't change as much. And they've done studies to see that this is true, that some of these basic things like pronouns and uh, demonstrative pronouns and uh, big, small, one, two, um, seed, leaf, root, some of these words, depending on the culture, of course, what, what they have to work with. Um, so they, this is used to um, try to calculate how different two languages are. So they don't just use the whole vocabulary, they use this sort of a core vocabulary. Okay, so uh, William Jones, very interesting figure in um, India in the 18th century, he was a, um, a magistrate um, in the British uh, colonial uh, world. And he, when he was out there, he had had a classic education. In the old days, if you were a gentleman, you had a classical education, studied Latin and Greek and so on. Um, so he knew uh, languages and he started to um, talked to the locals and he learned some Hindi and then he found out about Sanskrit, which is the sort of sacred language is comparable to Latin. And he said, you know what? These languages have a lot in common. And so it was a 
huge revelation. You know, how could you go all the way to India of all places and find people speaking similar languages? So um, that was the beginning of really recognizing that we have these cognates. And so here, um, the word for mother in Sanskrit is matar. This means it hold the hold the a a little bit longer, matar, and father is pitar. Greek it's pater, Latin it's pater, fader and father. So now we're getting into Germanic languages here. See, we we've, we've gone from the Latinate words, and now we're we're including Greek and Sanskrit, um, and uh, and and over here we have the. PIE, which is the Proto-Indo-European. Of course, this is a reconstructed, uh, and that gives you what way they think. So the, the PIE um, word is written in the phonetic alphabet, and it's what it, what it represents is what word could all of these be derived from? So if all these daughter words are like, they are, what does that tell us about the ancestor? The ancestor must have had the potential to, to change into um, these words. And through that process, they've um, reconstructed the Indo-European language family. And um, so the earliest, they reckon Indo-European could have been about 5,000 years. Uh, and we'll get into a little bit about how you how you figure that out. But here's the Romance languages, French, Spanish, and so on. And here's the Germanic languages, and English is here in, as, a, as a, a Germanic language. The Baltic and Slavic languages here. Uh, Celtic, so the, the, they're, they're listing here the extant uh, Celtic languages. Of course, a lot of them have been lost. Uh, Armenian, Greek. And in the East, you've got the... Um, Indic languages, and you've got the Aryan languages, which are um, spoken in um, Iran and places like that, Persian, stuff like that. So that's kind of the big picture of the uh, Indo-European language family. And I thought I should share a little bit about the, um, the oldest texts that we have. And there's, there's, these are all from the second millennium BC. So we're Talking pretty far back. Um, here's one uh, written in Sanskrit, which is a, a fragment of the Rig Veda. The Rig Veda is one of the holy texts of, uh, of Hinduism. Um, and it uh, records the arrival of Indo-Europeans in South Asia. And I just wanted to point out, they came in these carts pulled by horses, at least the nobility did. Uh, so we're going to see that as a pattern. So that's an early text. Uh, here's an early text from the Hittites. So the Hittite Empire is up here in uh, Anatolia in central Turkey, but it extended down and they had relations with uh, Egypt and not always friendly. Um, and so um, this is the 1450 BC um, at the time of Minoan Linear A. So uh, We'll get into that a little bit later. But this is a, this is a picture of a cuneiform tablet. So they're using the cuneiform that they learned from the Babylonians and the people in uh, Mesopotamia. But they've borrowed it and they're expressing um, Indo-European language, the Hittite language, uh, on this clay tablet. Again, they're in a cart or a chariot and with horses. Um, that's we're going to come back to that. Um, and here's the the Greek uh, earliest Greek that we can dis decipher. There is linear A, which nobody can read, but linear B has been deciphered. And so this is from uh, Mycenaean period uh, after the decline of the Minoans. But here's a, a map of where the Mycenaeans were, and here they are with a horse and a chariot. So uh, getting back to the big picture, you can see that um, these languages uh, are all part of the Indo-European family. And there is this break where the Turks came through. 
And then there's the Persian languages and the uh, Hindu languages or Hindi and related languages down here. Um, so, uh, and then of course, spread more widely once you get uh, European colonialism included. So um, I'm gonna try playing this, I hope it works. Um, one of these linguists um, decided that he wanted to try to say something in Proto-Indo-European. So this is creating a, a, a recreating a language that's thousands of years old. And um, I'm gonna try to stop it a little bit in there to talk just a bit, but obviously no, nobody can go to Proto-Indo-European and people and this, this thing has been extinct for thousands of years, but through the reconstruction, this is what they think it sounded like. Rex the war queen. So I always want to point out uh, Rex. Rex, if you studied Latin, you know what Rex means king. And Deus means God. And que in Latin, when they put it on the end of a word, it means and. So the king and the God. Now, it blows me away that the, it's so close to Latin. so anyway that's uh an attempt how do i get out of that Jeez. okay let's go here yeah so that's an attempt to uh these these h's what this represents is there are some of the sounds that they don't really know quite what to make of so they they just um uh have a symbol to say okay it's that one but anyway um so here we're, we're looking at the um, Proto-Indo-Europeans and where they lived and so on, and it's been figured out. Um, and in the genetics and the archeology span part, which was the previous talk, um, they we explained a little bit more, but this map has um, data from different sources. And what they estimate is that the, uh, the Proto-Indo-European speakers were we're living in this area, which is all too familiar with us right now because of the war in Ukraine. Um, so here's the Dnieper River, which is a boundary in um, Donetsk. And um, so what it has to do with this is um, uh, step pastoralists. So what that means is that there are people riding around on horses and herding animals and getting rich by doing it. So um, it's something that, you know, we, we think how could, how, could her, how, could, how could these pastoralists have had such a big effect? Well, if you look at the history of the Turks and the Mongols, you can see what a big effect they had. So anyway, it shows a spread into uh, Europe of the different languages. And we'll take a little closer look at Celtic in, 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 in a minute. Um, so, um, here's a Proto-European word meaning axle, which is a pretty interesting point because an axle, you don't have an axle in the CFA cart. So that's a secret of their success. Uh, Sanskrit akshas, Latin axis, Lithuanian ashis, 
and so on, and Echo and Celtic and so on. And so Axel is from this, they, they reconstruct the root as something X. So the X part is a big, big part of it. Now the oldest preserved Axel that we have is from uh, Slovenia. And that's a, around over 3000 BC. Um, here's an Axel in the grave uh, in the North Caucasus steppes. So what's not uh, decided, there is some, uh, you know, the, the standard narrative in ancient history is that the, the wheel and the axle and the cart, uh, these things were invented uh, in Mesopotamia and then spread from there. But I think we have to recognize that the people in the steppe had horses and they had a need for uh, a, a, a cart. And so they adopted it very quickly if they didn't actually invent it themselves. And nobody's sure on that point. So this is just a little bit about steppe culture. Um, this is from the Turkic people, but um, you get the same idea and what we see in step culture is loyalty to kin, courage, culture, horsemanship. They're mobile as pastoralists and hunters. So uh, that's a big item. Um, horseback riding, of course. Uh, they're animists. It's always tricky to figure out what people were believing. Uh, raiding between tribes and trading with sedentary peoples. So there's a long history of relationship of pastoral people with a sedentary uh, people in the nearby. And I just wanted to put this slide in because I wanted to compare it with our cowboy. So in the, here's the cowboy out on the range. This is, this is uh, the guy who, whose job is to cook for everybody. And every cattle drive had their cookie or whatever they called him. And um, he had to have a wagon and because the thing is, you get out on the step, it, it's, there's not a lot of water out there. You know, it isn't like you're going to find streams. So if you, if you don't have a horse and a horse and cart, you can't really use the step very well. It's kind of a barrier because you, there's not enough water. If you're trying to walk across, um, you're not going to make it. So once you get horses and carts, this whole world opens up. And the step, which previously was a barrier, is now a highway. And so that was true in the American West with the cowboys as well. So here's the domestication of the horse happened in the Eurasian steppe, probably a little farther east, um, and uh, changed history and dramatically. Uh, this is the steppe belt geographically, the steppe uh, is at a certain latitude. So uh, using Russian terms, we talk about the tundra, the taiga, the steppe, and then the desert. So it's, just, it's, a, it's a gradient of um, environments that goes all across uh, Eurasia. So this steppe is a grassland. And if, you are, if, you, if you're adapted to the grassland, you can go all the way from one, one end to the other. And you can go pretty quickly. So here's the spread of the steppe pastoralists. Um, the Yamnaya are considered the sort of the root culture here at uh, 3300 um, BC. Um, Yamnaya actually refers to uh, pits or holes in the ground because they buried their dead in these pits and they covered them up with a, a, what they call a tumulus, it's a, called a kurgan. So it's a characteristic burial practice. Um, but we see them spreading uh, into, in all directions. They actually get it over here to China. These are called Tocharians. This is um, not there anymore, but we have records of it. And then this, era, this is going down into India and over here into Persia. So um, that's, that's uh, how they've spread. And this is probably my favorite slide of all, because here you have the Proto-Indo-Europeans beginning here and then moving west. And these are the, the different families of European languages, the Baltic languages, the Slavic languages, Germanic, 
Celtic, uh, Italic. Um, here's Celtic moving that way. Um, and then coming down here into the Balkans, we get Albanian and Greek and Armenian. Armenian seems to have started here, at least linguistically, it's uh, part of this group, but then some of them branched off apparently to, to get over to Armenia. And then coming this way, the uh, Iranic and the Indic languages over here on, on the east. So from the source, <laughs> All this light green is uh, is the spread of Indo-European. So, um, yeah, try to get through this. History of English language. This is an extremely interesting slide, and you can come back on, on the recording if you want to. But um, the Celts were the first people in England that we have good records of or good knowledge. There certainly were hunter-gatherers before the Celts but we don't really have much information about what they spoke. Um, then the conquest of the Romans uh, brought in Latin, and then the Roman Empire declined in the late 400s, and the um, Angles and Saxons and Jutes came in, so that's the Germanic part. Um, Vikings uh, in the Northeast, uh, the Norman invasion brings in French. In the, in, in the Renaissance, you get a lot of Latin and Greek, and then in the um, empire phase, of course, the British Empire brought in words from uh, all over the empire. So uh, this is, again, one that's pretty interesting, Old English, Middle English, Modern English. There's a lot of detail in there. Um, but here's the Celtic speakers, and they've been able to trace the, them to the Yamnaya homeland. So the, the Celts, and this R1B, that's a genetic marker, Apparently, the, the Celts went westward, and then they spread uh, up the Danube River. And the Danube is a major uh, thoroughfare here to get into uh, Central and then into Western Europe. Um, and so the Celts came into the British Isles this way. But they didn't only, they, they, weren't, they, they, they weren't saying, oh, let's go to England. They were just going places to try it out. And this is the, the maximum spread of the Celtic people is shown in this orange color. And it's totally amazing because right now the Celts are, you know, in these little fringe areas, uh, they're, they're not widespread at all. And so we, we have to look at, well, what happened to all the rest of them? But archeologically, there's a core here in um, Central Europe, and then they spread from there even into Spain. So anytime you see the word uh, Gaul or Ga uh, Galicia or Gaelic, you know those are other those are um, names uh, related to Celts. Um, you know, here's the uh, the modern Celtic speaking areas. Some of these places are rarely working hard to try to preserve uh, the Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire comes all the way up to Hadrian's Wall here. Um, and uh, they, the Romans um, made a huge impact. Uh, they, they hauled off millions, literally millions of slaves. Uh, they took many, many people from the Celtic areas to, uh, to Italy, to North Africa, to work on plantations. And, um, and they subs they subdued all the tribes and they made them, they really basically turned them into serfs. So uh, the Celts lost their, their punch uh, by the Roman Empire. It took hundreds of years. It wasn't a, a quick thing. But uh, now the place is speaking Latin or some derivative. Well, the Romans got theirs uh, in, in the end. Uh, here's the uh, Germanic. They never had much luck conquering the Germans, but the Germans were all up in this area. And uh, here you see these various uh, tribes going into the Roman Empire as, the, as it declines. So the Franks, I always think that's sort of funny that France is named after this Germanic tribe, but it's so, so it is. Um, Alemanni, I find this one really interesting because if you, you've, if you, if you want to know the word for German, in French or in Spanish, 
it's Alaman or Aleman. So uh, what it means is all the men. And so what this tells us, it's a composite tribe. It isn't, it, as, as they're fighting back, they form alliances and, and they get uh, chiefdoms. And, and, uh, and so what is the name? Well, it's all the men. And then the Goths, the Visigoths, the Vandals, the Vandals coming up this way. So uh, the Roman Empire in the West um, was uh, overrun by the by these various Germanic tribes. In the East, uh, the Roman Empire held on a little bit longer, but eventually the a lot of their land was taken over by the Arab Arab expansions. Now here's a little bit more um, close up look at the. Um, tribes coming into England. So they've got the, the uh, Frisians. The Frisians, this is uh, the closest language to English that, that's, that's out there. They still speak it uh, in Holland. Um, but the Saxons, Angles, and Jutes, these all came in and uh, established colonies, of which the Saxons turned out to be the strongest. But um, they uh, had their problems with... Um, uh, here, yeah, this is this is the Dane law. So, in you know, the, all these different uh, tribes, and they're trying to establish kingdoms and so on. Well, the Danes came in and and took over a big section here. This had an effect on the English language. You know, the English language uh, starts out as Anglo-Saxon, which is the language that they kind of put together between these tribes in the in the south, but then where they're bordering up on the uh, the Danish area, they have to kind of create a little lingua franca to, to uh, talk with them. So so the Danish there are a lot of words, but more than that, it's it, it's probably simplified, um, and uh, so it had an, a structural effect as well. Um, and then, um, the, the, um, William the Conqueror and, uh, coming in from, these are the, um, uh, the Norse, um, the Normans. So Norman, this is Norman, uh, France, this is Normandy. So you say Normandy, what is Normandy? Well, Norman, Normans are Norse men. So, the Normans uh, are are are, are de, uh, descended from uh, Vikings and other Norse who came down and established a kingdom here, and they got to be quite powerful, and they got to be uh, Frenchified. They spoke uh, Norman French, and so when they came in at 1066 and 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 took over England, um, they brought a lot of French. So. Um, English has got a huge amount of French in the vocabulary. Uh, so just some examples, um, you know, religious words, uh, law words, and so on, and on and on. But if you look at uh, the distribution of uh, languages and of uh, source material in the English language, uh, I find it c c kind of curious that Germanic, Latin, and French, these are all uh, very strong influences. So um, why do they say that English is basically a Germanic language? Why wouldn't you say that it's a, um, a Romance language? Well, because the structure, if you look at the structure, and you, if you've ever studied German, I think you'd see that uh, we say things in similar word order, mostly, not, not all. Uh, and um, the basic kind of, of foundational words, uh, going back to Swadesh's list, uh, are of Germanic origin. Um, and now, of course, we have all these um, accents and dialects and, you know, people, you know, there's different kinds of English. So look how many different kinds of English there are in England. Uh, now you think about all the different kinds of English. There's American English, Australian English, there's Indian English, there's you know, the English that they're speaking to on the, um, uh, when, when, when you have to call somebody and they say, well, we're going to send you to the call center and who knows where those people are from. Uh, so, uh, and then American dialects. Um, people try to 
figure out, you know, what uh, what different dialects are. It, you know, how they draw these lines, I, I don't, I, I find really challenging, but but that's kind of an approximation there. Um, so anyway, that we saw this one. So finally, the last thing that I'd like to do, and I'd like to get your feedback on this, uh, has to do with pronouns. And so um, these are the pronouns that we learned in school and that we use for the most part. And I just wanted to make two points about these. Um, one is that um, we distinguish gender in the third person, he and she. Now, that's unusual in English, because if you look at either German or French or Spanish, uh, all the words are gendered, all the nouns and adjectives. So you can, uh, there's a lot of gender in the language. And so you have um, the table, for example, is feminine. No, what's a table doing feminine? I have no idea. But it's not It's not that it's feminine. It's just that it belongs in that category. But English, we don't really do that. And so uh, here's an example where we, where it's, it's sort of an old fashioned thing. Um, and then the other thing is that it's, it's, um, has case endings or it's, it has case. What, what that means is that the, if we take the pronoun I, well, if it's, if it's a, an object, it would be me, uh, at, and my and mine. Now you don't do that with other, uh, with nouns or adjectives generally. It's a relic of the Germanic past. And so um, pronouns are, that's one thing interesting about them. Um, now, second person pronouns by region. So this is American. Um, standard is uh, singular is you, plural is you, multiple is you, possessive is your and yours. All right, now my dialect at home was you, use is plural, use guys is multiple, and uses is the possessive. Okay, now if you go to Texas, it's you, y'all, all y'all, and y'alls. So we got a lot, of, now I was raised as a Quaker, so I'm familiar with this, the, actually, if you go back in history, it should be thou, but my experience in Quaker meeting was that people said the, they, they didn't conjugate it that way. But the plural is you. So this is the historical, um, and there's a reason why the Quakers st uh, stuck with it. Um, and you and thy or your. And then in California, we have you, you guys, all you guys, and your guyses. So um, it's very inventive. You know, it's very... Um, if you if you if if you lose the 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 and go to you, then you have to figure out something for plural. And so we do. The language is creative. So here's a a, a slide, a, a map of where y'all is and you guys, and then you guys is over here where I was where I was raised. Um, so uh, nowadays we have this issue of the of the uh, pronouns, you know, what, what pronouns do you use? What are your pronouns? And so in many contexts um, around here, no, I don't think this is true in Texas, but uh, around here, people are always want to know what are your pronouns and you're supposed to declare. And uh, this, this over here is a, a shot from where I volunteer at the Academy of Sciences. Uh, when you go in, uh, they have this uh, little uh, table with these pins on there. And so you can pick your pronouns and you can put a pin on there. And I thought, well, okay. And, but some of these are pretty weird, you know, Zay, Zier, and Ziers. Uh, who's got pronouns like that? Uh, so apparently some people do, and if, it, if it's going to happen anywhere, it's going to be in San Francisco. So, um, anyway, this has got more about the, the grammar, uh, how it works, you know, how you're supposed to use them and people get, uh, 
upset about it. Uh, but then uh, I just wanted to point out one thing is that here's a, a sentence. Any English teacher who uses they, them as a singular pronoun should lose their teaching license. Well, of course, there is in that series with they and them. So, but that's how we say it. And that's a standard um, way, way to uh, express that idea. Um, so uh, English teachers generally don't want to tell people how to, how to talk. Uh, they want to, I mean, some are more that way than others, but there's the difference between describing how people talk and then telling them how they talk. So anyway, what's your pronoun? Um, I would be interested at this point to get your take on on this pronoun business and what um, what we should uh, should should Ashby Village, for example, have buttons that have my pronouns are he, him, or they, them, or what do you think about that whole issue? So that that's my presentation, and um, I would like at this point to open it to discussion and questions and um, and uh, so Hillary, do you have any uh, questions in the chat or any? Yeah, we we have a we have a couple, but uh, maybe if people want to jump in on the pronoun question first, okay. since you just asked it, is there anybody yeah. there wants to to take that one up before we go to the chat? Well, it, it just it bothers me to um, can I can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. that's fine. Yeah, it bothers me to use a plural pronoun for a singular person, mm -hmm. unless you're Siamese twins. You know, I mean, really, uh, it. The, I think we should have thought of a new word, made up a new one, mm -hmm. rather than use a plural, because it doesn't mm -hmm. make sense, logically. <laughs> well... I mean, I'm Joan, only one Joan person. is shaking her head vigorously. Would you unmute of... yourself, Joan? Okay, uh, I disagree. I think that um, we are all using they as a singular all the time. Somebody lost their keys. Would they please come and get them at the desk? Um, so That's an unknown. Well, yeah, because we don't know if it's a male or female, so we use no, they. But we know they're not uh, plural. We know that only one person lost their keys. Oh. And so I think we do it very, very naturally and very um, comfortably most of the time. And the problem is that people don't know what verb to use with with they. Should mm. they say they is, like she mm. is, or <laughs> say they, they are. And it seems to me that the, we should take the lesson from the history of you, which was originally a, a, a plural, and we do say you are, even when it's one person. No, but we do it comfortably. So mm -hmm. if you can say you are, you should be able to say they are about a singular person, just as you mm -hmm. say you are about mm -hmm. a singular person. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think that um, I, yeah, I agree, your logic. agree that it's a lot. I, I agree that it's illogical, but it goes along with so many other illogical things that we do comfortably that uh, it doesn't bother me. <laughs> Teach it to the three-year-olds. Uh, Alan, did you want to jump in there? Yeah, well, I was going to say one thing that you haven't said. A lot has to do with the use of ungendered, complicated, uh, and this is British too, parental first names. It used to be that all the first names indicated the genders. You can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. So does that make people feel uneasy if you don't... Uh, know the gender of somebody uh, the adults yes mm -hmm. because there are huge differences i that, that's a different topic but there is a traditional male and a traditional female uh, image mm -hmm. which may be different from all of us but they're, they're there they're social they're evolved and they're often forgotten mm -hmm. in, in our in our desire to to identify everybody as the same but we are not the same and our names used to tell what we were. Now oh. they don't. So Not all we, the names, just some of them. That's right. I, I, 
absolutes don't belong in anything I say. <laughs> well, that's why we have to have the pronoun uh, badges to uh, clear that up. Or we can live with not knowing. <laughs> I don't know where most people were born. We don't have badges for that. So in a social group, uh, that clothing is important too. We clothe ourselves and we signal what we want people mm -hmm. to think we are. Mm -hmm. And we do it with words. We do it with clothing and, and with what we do. Servers versus servies, uh, yeah. loud versus soft. There's lots of gender differences that we learn when we are three to 10 years old. Mm -hmm. But why is it that people get so upset about this? I mean, if you go on the internet and search uh, yeah. Yeah. modern pronouns or something, you find this absolute vitriol. I mean, people are just so upset about it. It, it, it just yeah. really twists them. You know, they're like, how can you do that? I'm when they, were, th when oh, they yeah. were three, they learned a gender which they were their mothers their fathers all the people around it and then we hit them with lo logic mm -hmm. and well, then some of the modern or technological changes too audrey want to jump in with this one yeah i i wonder why <clears throat> i mean if somebody is looking for a sexual partner i guess it's very important that they uh identify as one sex or the other. But if they don't, if they're not, then what's the point? I mean, why do we have to, uh, you, your point about the uh, traditional male and the traditional female. I think that this movement toward um, non-binary is sort of a statement that the person doesn't want to be labeled as the traditional male or the traditional female. They want to be whatever they are. And so that's fine. Mm -hmm. So but that this, keeps changing. Yeah. Could, I mean, they could make a decision and make that change once. Well, that, that's one of the problems. The uncomfortable ones want it fixed. This is not Hey, I, hey you want to chat? You have a question? It's not a question. I was having a discussion with a relative. I was in a group. Uh, in which everyone introduced themselves and was supposed to say their pronouns. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. her point of view was that this is a way of making everyone feel welcome. My point of view was that if you had to do it, you were being forced to show your allegiance to a certain idea or group. And that right. more like a salute rather than an inclusive feel. So um, we agreed to disagree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with you. I Me do too. too. <laughs> Virginia had a comment. Oh, I am I on? Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I, I was just uh, thinking how I'm generally pleased when we could make pronouns less gender specific um, because the way it, it is now, I mean, even barring the most confusing period we're in right now, but there was always this he or she, you know, rather than being able to clump everyone together, that that we stumbled over this. Um, we'd get tongue-tied sometimes trying to interject the right um, or be inclusive. So if we could do that with a single word, I'd much prefer it. Um, but my question is really more about who will decide this? <laughs> who who are the who are the deciders here? Who who will ultimately, or will it simply be whatever the majority starts speaking? Children decide. Uh -huh. That's a good point. Yeah, and grow up. <laughs> yeah, and then their children decide something else. Yeah, some of them. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but yeah, it, we're it still is. a still divided. There's he, she, and they. There are still he and she. That didn't go away. If we were all they, then we would be fair, maybe. And that is a problem for the binaries, <laughs> or the non-binaries, I should say. For the non-binaries, be... exactly. <laughs> Do you want to share that pronoun with all of us? <laughs> well, they will change. I have a family member who is eight years old and hasn't changed. He wants the pronoun. 
he'll get the pronoun because people want to do what she, he or she, I can't even straighten that out, wants. <laughs> but dress cures that. Mm. You can't usually appear in a binary, in a non-binary form. You can. There are some articles of dress that cover both. But yeah, I've, had, I've had my dress turn. stores. Yeah. Oh. Well, uh, they, they evolve. But I Joan, very do you want to Joan, do you want to go back to your Latvian question? Maybe, but uh, let me say something else first. I think that the human race, all of us, not just English speakers, but the human race is very, um, uh, not very gender dy dimorphic. That is, if you look at chimpanzees, you the, you can tell adult females from adult males just from their size and the other other characteristics. Birds, you can usually tell which is the male and which is the female from the coloration. But we're more like turtles. Um, we are not that different. <laughs> right. Not Good. that different. Yeah. We are focusing on the differences, perhaps, but we are we are made quite similarly, male and female. And that's why it's possible for people to be non-binary. It wouldn't be possible otherwise. Mm -hmm. Anyway, mm -hmm. I can go to the other question. Um, my late husband, who was Latvian, um, always insisted that the Latvian language was the closest to Indo-European, original Indo-European. And he claimed to be able to sound out Sanskrit and make it sound like Latvian or vice versa. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But um, it, does that contradict your point, um, Roger, about Lithuanian, or are Lithuanian and Latvian so similar that you don't make the distinction? Yeah, I think that the latter is uh, is true. The, they're both Baltic languages, and the Baltic split off from Slavic uh, quite a long time ago, and they, I think, they have this sort of a conservative. Um, uh, effect just like the um, Icelanders, you know, had that they, they kind of got off by themselves and didn't change that much. Where Slavic, they spread the Slavs are m much more widely spread, and Slavic has evolved more. But yeah, I don't think. Um, yeah, I would be very interested to to see how somebody like that would do it. But uh, that's fascinating. He used to say that he was a let. And that the, mm -hmm. that the uh, the Lettish language is really the the root language. Yeah, well, I don't know. He, he's well, probably anth uh, anthropocentric or um, culture centric, but he uh, that's okay. Uh, I think he's got a point. Yeah. Thank Except you. that the Latvians Ma and the Lithuanians have a different religion. That's right. They do. Which made yeah. a difference. Oh, and as okay. a, someone with a Latvian father, mother, and a Lithuanian father, uh, I guess I'm a bolt. Oh, <laughs> right. Marty so had a question that uh, he's ready to ask now. Oh, the question that I was thrown out had nothing to do with pronouns, uh, Roger. So that's okay. <laughs> it was really the question of uh, uh, anthropologists and their ability to. Uh, project a language spoken on, uh, mm. you know, when they find, uh, you know, in the homo sapien, you know, dispersion, how do they equate the distribution of languages or assignment of language to some of the remains uh, that they come across? Oh, okay, that's a really important point. In other words, how, how can we know that these people were speaking a Celtic language as they migrated up the Danube River? Mm -hmm. or, right. Yeah, that that is something that has really developed in the last few years. And it has to do with the DNA. Because what they're, before, what we had was archaeological cultures. So you would have... Um, you know, it, it, there's been a lot of anthropology and archaeology done in um, in in Europe, in particular. So they have these um, particular corded ware culture. You know, they, they find these different sites and they have archaeological similarities. A lot of times, it has to do with pottery, 
or the shape of their spear points or you know they have different different names like that so if you had the corded wear people you you could sort of trace where they lived and you could see and there's dating so you could see which ones were older and which ones were younger and so they so you could see that this went back uh towards the east perhaps so then but how do you know how they're related to the the living to because they we don't have a record we don't, we don't we don't have a recording of their language so what they do is they they do it through the genetics and they can they've gone back all these sites that have, were excavated for many years um people have gone back and they've um dug up and extracted dna and the, the big turning point in this field was was when um when the uh, the max planck institute was able to sequence the dna of um, neanderthals in 2010 but um, since then they've used this technology they found that there are certain bones that preserve the dna better and so uh they can now uh trace genetically the corded wear people with the Celts, for example. And um, so that's been a really big breakthrough because uh, this whole field of Indo-European studies has been, you know, there are a lot of mysteries, like which ones are related to which modern uh, peoples. And uh, so that's one of the core questions. And I think that the DNA is what really made the difference. Thank you. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay, any more other questions? Um, Another question. Yeah. Um, I would. I used to be very interested in something called proto-world. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering what your opinion is about the possibility of uh, a basic vocabulary for all humans. Oh, like Esperanto? No, no. Uh, proto-world was um, a... a, a um, Oh, I, I guess it was extrapolation back, just like you were talking about Proto-Indo-European mm -hmm. for all languages. Oh, all, all the way back? All the way back. Uh -huh. and, um, the question is whether, do you, do you think that the people who are talking about that, are you aware of it? And do you think that they have, um, uh, they have a, te a technique that actually gives us information about an original language? Well, there have certainly been attempts. The, there are, you know, linguists, there's different kinds of linguists. Some are very, very nitpicky and would never admit any connection. But for example, the Indo-Europeans, um, there uh, are linguists who think that, that that language family is related uh, to the Uralic languages, the Northern ones. And, but then for a while there, we used to call it Uralic. They even called it Uralic Altaic because there's Altaic. So when you get to that level, the differences are so deep. I mean, you can find little hints. It's like it's like uh, digging around uh, in an archaeological site and you find a little bit here and a little bit there. What do you make out of it? And um, at this point, uh, I would say that the majority opinion among linguists is that when we get these uh, language families, like I showed on the slide, uh, that's as far as we can go with any certainty. Okay. Now, if you ask the question, well, did they actually all originally come fr from some Tower of Babel or something like that? Uh, <laughs> you know, it's a uh, it's hard to say. I, I guess it's possible. I mean, if you if you think that we all came from, you know, uh, mitochondrial Eve or you know some fossil or I mean not that particular one, but that type, uh, it is amazing that that all the progeny could go forth and conquer the earth and uh, start speaking different languages. But uh, I think what it has to do with is the creativity of children. Mm -hmm. I think that's the main, if you, I, I think the, the most wonderful thing about language is that it's recreated every day. I mean, we recreate it and our kids recreate it and language is a very dynamic process. And, and and culture is too, but you know, we kind of get bogged down in 
well, you know, we don't want to change and things. Why should I change? Things are okay. And how, these people are using other pronouns. Oh my God, you know, what am I going to do? You know? Uh, and so I think it's, as you get older, you know, you get more conservative or you get more cautious and, uh, but the kids are like, Hey, go for it. You know, let's, let's, let's challenge our gender norms, you know? And uh, it's pretty remarkable. Um, we see it, of course, more quickly because our culture is very dynamic and we have people coming from all over the world and all these things going on. Uh, but I think culture is always like that. Um, it's a creative process. Yeah. So, okay, uh, anybody else got a last word? Well, thank you very much for tuning in. Um, about a topic that I is near and dear to my heart, and uh, I look forward to talking to you about it uh, in some other venue. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, right. And thanks all to you all of you for participating in the discussion. Um, before you go, I just wanted to mention that our next presentation will be climate change and social consequences. Um, presented by Dr. L. Dismore Swift, a uh, doctorate from the geology department. Uh, it will be on April 11th at 3 p.m. And the URL will be the same one you used for Roger's presentation today. So I uh, hope to see you then. And it's been a very nice uh, afternoon hearing from all of you. That was really great. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey.